uh, you know, this lecture, I hope, would become the reason for you to visit Pakistan and actually see for yourself the country beyond the news headlines. Now, my name is, as you, as uh, Ron has already uh, for the past few years, I have, uh, I have sort of chosen to focus on the Buddhist heritage of Pakistan because I see a great potential for Pakistan in this particular uh, category of heritage. heritage. As you know, Pakistan has a vast heritage, but I keep saying that you have to see uh, the global uh, potential in Gandhara heritage. We can build bridges and we can, you know, actually, uh, you know, put Pakistan under a different spotlight if you are able to, uh, you know, hold on to this uh, Buddhist legacy. Uh, now, I, I think, uh, you know, I know, as during this presentation, you will also get to know about me and my work rather than I sort of phrase it in so many uh, sort of uh, words. I would like you to sort of see what we are doing here through uh, our, uh, our activities that will I will share at the end of this sort of 30 minutes that I have. I have actually gathered a whole lot of material and uh, uh, you know, so I will see how quickly I can move through that. And there are certain points that I just want to convey and then the information about the sites uh, uh, is available. And as you would see in our presentation that we have produced a Gandhara heritage map of all the major sites in Pakistan for anybody to come and visit. And so we can even send you as many copies as you want, you know, hard copies for you to actually see and enjoy. Uh, the images there. In, a, in, in any case, so uh, I, I would say that our, sort of my presentation is actually, uh, and I speak, I'll try and, uh, uh, you know, share the screen. My presentation is actually based on, you know, it has four parts, right? And I will, I will begin, uh, I will begin uh, with the uh, you know, with the, uh, with kind of setting the context for you, uh, what is Gandhara, where is Gandhara located, and why it is important. Now, if you look at the map, you know, Gandhara is right here, and it's, you know, all these countries surround them. And it has, you know, three major capital cities in Pakistan. One is Peshawar, Pushpura, Pushkalavati, Charsada, which is in Sabat, and Tekshila, uh, you know, Texla, where I kind of generally work. So Gandhara became a major center of Buddhism in Indian subcontinent, for, especially from first century and to approximately a seventh century C. Now the kingdom of Gandhara, why it became so important? Because it, it stood at the crossroad of these uh, civilizations in a way. It was actually the hub of, uh, you know, one of the circuits on which the Silk Route, you know, uh, you know, cut across the region of Gandhara at various points. As a result, there was a kind of a fusion of world cultures, which were European and Central Asian and Indian. So that really produced a marvel of Gandhara and the religious syncretism and cross-cultural fermentation. This is just a succession of dynasties in Gandhara. If you broadly look at these, you know, from the Achaemenian rule in 6th century BC. And if, for instance, when Buddha uh, was born, uh, you can imagine that Gandhara was under the Achaemenian rules. Now, Achaemenian uh, empire was destroyed by Alexander and then comes these Greeks and then the Mauryans, the great King Ashoka and so on. It just kind of uh, carries on for almost like thousand years. And all these dynasties uh, had, had for, for whatever reasons, they actually invested a whole lot on Buddhism, almost making it like a state religion. There wasn't any state religion in the ancient world, but it was like a huge patronage being given to the monasteries. And especially in these monasteries in Gandhara, you will find these kitchens and storage spaces, which were actually some kind of deviation from the Buddha's, uh, you know, sort of a message uh, not to store anything. And in any case, 
So, uh, but the point is that most of these people like Ashoka or Menander or Kanishka, they continue to give enormous patronage to Gandhara and leading to the resurgence of this Gandhara sculpture that we see in the World Museum today. Where does it come from? It, it came from huge imperial patronage. It came from merchants patronage. It came from the elite classes uh, patronizing, trying to illustrate the life of the Buddha. Now, you know, very interestingly, apart from these archeological sources, uh, there are these religious sources within Buddhism, like the Jataka tale, we tell about Gandhara. And, uh, you know, they, they, they tell, you know, they, they, especially the stories of the Bodhisattva uh, are actually anchored, some of these are anchored in Gandhara, especially the one called Telipata. Now, Telipata Jataka is an amazing, very extraordinary story. I wish I could, you know, uh, tell the story here. But it is, it is the story of a king of Texla, how he became the king of Texla by actually, uh, you know, sort of competing with all these voices, <laughs> voices of men, like for love for luxury, beauty, music, food, comfort, and so on and so forth. So Jataka stories also, uh, you know, tell about the region of Gandhara and the capital city of Texla, so all of that uh, was recorded in the uh, sort of uh, Buddhist literature. Now, this is my second point. My second point is, the, you know, world has to understand the significance of Gandhara for the history of Buddhism. You know, it appears that despite this enormous scholarship on Gandhara, uh, neither uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, tourism nor some kind of a policy attention is given to Pakistan's face of Gandhara. Pakistan is always, always projected in, in a one light. And we just want to actually, you know, change the color of our country to see that, you know, we are also about something else as well. Now, as you would know, the Texela was the uh, leading center of uh, learning in the ancient world. And it offered like 63 courses in Vedas, astronomy, philosophy, surgery, politics, all kinds of things, not just Buddhist education, which became part of it after many centuries. So, uh, you know, Texala University predated Buddhism. Uh, likewise, it alumni were really very famous people. There are lots of accounts of those people who studied at Texala. And Jeevuk is one of the ph physician of uh, Buddha, who was also a student here. And, uh, and lo and behold, we all know, you know, from an Indian point of view, if you like, the, uh, about Panini, you know, the, the grammarian who actually, uh, you know, father of linguistics and actually, uh, you know, um, in, in, in sort of constructed the rules of the grammar of Sanskrit language. He was a, he was a teacher at Texla University. And I think that Pakistan should lay a claim uh, to the cultural leg legacies of uh, Panini and other teachers of uh, Texla University like Chankya, who actually the one who fathered, almost fathered the first Indian uh, civilization. Actually, uh, you know, Magadha kingdom was defeated uh, f by the forces which originate from Texla and they invaded Magadha kingdom. And this is how the Mauryan empire came to be. So, so, so I think all these annals of history uh, you know, resonate very strongly, uh, you know, in our minds as the cultural legacy of Pakistan, which needs reclamation. So, and his book sort of Shastra is phenomenal. You know, I keep sort of going back to the book and I find sort of really, really amazing ways how we analyze human and social and political behavior. Likewise, you know, this is again sort of Pakistan's best kept secret, so to say, that the founding scriptures of Buddhism uh, which predates uh, Pali manuscript were found here in Gandhara since the 20th century, right? And one of the very famous ones were Gilgit manuscripts, right? And which had this Lotus Sutra in it. And they were uh, in this hybrid Sanskrit language in Brahmian post Gupta uh, scripts, you know, from seven, from second century BC to sixth century scholars are divided about the dating of these birch bark manuscripts, right? So they were found in Bajor and they were found in other places and they continue to be found till today because of this colder climate of Gilkis Bastistan, these birch bark never decompose. So if it's stored in a uh, you know, cooler zone, then it becomes even more, uh, you know, long lasting. So th then it also, you know, what this literature is telling, this literature is telling these stories, uh, you know, uh, giving 
uh, have recorded the Buddha's message quite earlier on, as I said, before the Pali Canon, which came to dominate uh, Buddhist theology. So new sort of revelations are being made for scholars. And I, I think we have every right to be uh, proud of our uh, this history. Now, likewise, uh, you know, not many people know that, uh, you know, the, this uh, region of Gandhara was also the site of the teachers of Buddhism, right? The works of Gandhara scholars formed the basis of the translation of Buddhist religious canon into the languages of the countries in Central Asia, China, <coughs> and East Asia. Now, look at this guy, Lokak Sima, you know, Jana Gupta you know, Pranji. Now, all these guys were the ones who traveled from Gandhara to China, uh, you know, receiving imperial patronage uh, for their works and translated uh, from Sanskrit uh, to, the, uh, to the Chinese language, and they become the reason. Uh, and now, who could forget, you know, the most famous of, uh, let's say, you know, our sort of, uh, you know, characters, you know, the great Pandav Sambhava, now, who, whose origin in Udyana, as in Savat, has been established by the Italian archaeological mission in the 1950s? They have laid rest to the controversy that Padam Sambhava was not born elsewhere in India, but in Savat, which was called Udyana. Now, he's the man who took then, uh, you know, Buddhism to Tibet and actually a major contribution in Mahayana Buddhism and his sutras are very popular and his mantras and so on. So, and you would also know that uh, according to Mahaparivana Sutra, his sort of appearance uh, was also uh, kind of preordained uh, by no other than Sakyamuni Buddha. So I, I think these are some of the points that I want, uh, you know, the world to acknowledge and for Pakistan to realize that it is, uh, you know, a whole lot of history uh, that we have left unclaimed, right? Now, uh, you know, this again, as I said earlier, Gandhara, because of its geostrategic location, became the hub from where, you know, Buddhism spread from all over India. So if you look at the, this is what, where the Gandhara lies, right? Now, as a result of that, it led to Tibet, to China, to you know, North India, to Central Asia, and to so on and so forth. Likewise, if you look in Gilgit, you know, in Gil, you know, uh, Gilgit, the Bamiyan and Gilgit are connected in so many ways. And then these are the accounts of the Chinese pilgrimage, which shed a lot of light uh, on the conditions uh, in the ancient and the medieval world. Uh, who made pilgrimages to India and also to Gandhara. And these two famous characters, Fa Yan and Yang Dang, in 6th and 4th century BC, SE, were the ones who left you know, you know, detailed travel accounts, which became the reason, as you all know, uh, for, the, uh, for the Alexander Cunningham, uh, you know, the first director general of archaeology of uh, Survey of India. Uh, you know, it became the basis for him to trace the footsteps and then see though where the sites are located. And as they say, the text lab was precisely, uh, you, know, uh, you know, located on the site because of these uh, Chinese travel, uh, travel logs. Finally, I, I would say this thing about Pakistan, as you know, Gandhara, it is again, uh, nothing new, but it's a popular knowledge that the first anthropomorphic representation of Buddha was made in Gandhara because of the greco roman contact. You know, since the, you know, the third century onwards, Greeks were coming in after Alexander and then there were bacterian rule and so on. So much of that interaction did lead to a new sort of a category of uh, art from ancient India, which is called the Gandhara, which is very, very famous. And fasting Buddha is one of the prime sort of examples. I mean, every time I look at it, I mean, I just, uh, you know, the anatomical knowledge of the ancient sculptor is so amazing, you know, look at the attention to the realistic details of human body, such as the vein, ribs and bones, the level of, you know, anatomical knowledge is, is, is profound. So, so, so I think this has a result of, of all that naturalism that has come uh, from the Greek and the Roman sources. Likewise, uh, you would know the Bodhisattva, the most famous uh, character in, uh, in the in the in the Buddhist iconography, especially of Mahayana Buddhism, was was repeatedly illustrated in these uh, reliefs and sculptures. And as you know, on this point, that the uh, Buddhist art before Gandhara was anachronic. It did not. It's it kind sort of really 
uh, did not have a figurative uh, stress on the figurative. In fact, it actually just wanted to no face. Buddha had no face. So there was empty zone and Bodhi tree and Buddha footprint and the Dharma wheel, which were representation of Buddha. It is only in Gandhara this anthropomorphic representation began to take shape. Now, this is uh, how much time I've left now, please? Basically, as much as you like, but I think uh, at least 15 minutes. Good, so I, I'm right the, on, the, uh, on the spot. Now, now, this, now, this is the third section. And then finally, I would uh, share my work by way of introduction to uh, who we are and why we are talking to you. Now, Buddhist heritage sites in Pakistan are actually quite a few. And, uh, uh, sorry. Oops. Uh, yes. And this is a map that I had sent you a copy. It lists all these sites here. And I've also, uh, I've only, there are like 38 sites here. And I'm only listed few of them uh, for your sort of information. So it's not exhaustive uh, sort of uh, summary of the heritage sites in Pakistan. As you know, they are these. They are largely, uh, you know, comprising of stupas and monasteries, which are uh, within the ancient borders of Gandhara, right? Though the archaeological remains of Buddhism also found in Punjab and in Sindh, you know, so the other places and the Gilgil Baltistan as well. So this is just a very, very quick overview of what we have. Now, as you know, Peshawar Museum is one of the world famous uh, museum of Gandhara civilization. Because like Peshawar and like Texla Museum, they're like site museum. There were a whole lot of excavations going on, which led to uh, the construction of these museums. This, uh, this was meant for something else, and then were later transformed into a museum uh, in the early 20th century. And it has these one of the most you know, spectacular uh, Buddhist sort of sculptures and reliefs in its collection. Now, this is in former tribal areas called Shapola Stupa. It is, uh, you know, it's located on the route of the ancient Silk Road in the neighborhood of the Khyber Pass. So if you ever visit Khyber Pass, that's uh, one of the very really highly sought after places. And uh, the central dome rests on three tiered base. It's enormously built on a huge height and next to it is, an, is, is a medieval fort. Now, Jahanabad Buddha is very famous, and sadly, it was defaced by Taliban and was being reconstructed, which has been reconstructed by the Italian archaeological mission. It is actually six meter tall uh, image of a seated Buddha, which is said the largest carved Buddha in Central Asia after Bamiyan. So, so it it is one of the very very important, significant uh, sort of. Uh, uh, sculptures which have been preserved on the site, not because of the site, it can all be taken out in a museum. Likewise, these Mansera rock addicts have were also preserved on the site. There are a few more ro rock addicts in KP, but I've just listed one. And as you know, uh, in Khrushchev's script, it actually, uh, the addicts of the Emperor Ashoka after he became Buddhist are carved there. So they, all of these uh, texts have been translated and widely read by the scholars. So uh, likewise, uh, again in Savat, Shindigar Dar Stupa uh, is, uh, is one of, as they say, one of the largest in India and Pakistan. Probably it is almost comparable to one in Rawalpindi called Mankyala Stupa, but it is, it is uh, because of very you know, strange reason, it is very well preserved. So nobody has, uh, you know, preserved it, but it stays, you know, it has, you know, this is less sign of decay compared to the other sites. Now, again, this is one of the ancient sites in, in Savat called Butkaravan. I'm sorry for the blurry picture. And it is in Saidu Sharif. It was again built by Ashoka to house the ashes of the Lord Buddha. So it is, uh, it is a very sacred site and it has been built over many times. Likewise, you, as you would know, uh, Taft Bai is one of the world-renowned sites because it's on the World Heritage List since 1980. And as a result of that, it is one of the most frequently uh, visited Buddhist monastery that was founded in first century CE and remain in use till the seventh century. And it is divided into several separate sections such as monasteries, court, assembly court, chapel, 
and other uh, you know sections uh, for various uses now this is again one of its kind, you know, these Shatyal rock carving in Gilgit, Baltistan, on the Karakram Highway. They, they, are, they are such a, you know, extraordinary, uh, you know, sort of a work of art which have been created uh, almost over over a millennia. Because that place where they are carved on the joint rocks were uh, the place from where the people, you know, on these big boulders. Uh, are, they were a place where you know pilgrimage or the trader and the merchant will cross the Indus River, you know, and they sometimes they had to wait for days and months to uh, for the right kind of tide to cross. It was a very stormy river, and uh, so they had all these uh, you know carvings as sort of a, made on these rocks on the joint boulder for blessings, and they're just extraordinary. Now we come to our home place called the Texla Museum. Now Texla Museum is, a, is again, as I said, is a site museum and it actually have almost everything that was ever excavated in Texla. Because uh, by that time, uh, a whole, you know, the other museum were almost sort of uh, filled up to their capacities uh, like Lahore Museum and Peshawar Museum. So whatever was actually excavated from around Texla uh, was placed in. So it is really worth seeing. Now, this is Bamala Stupa. Uh, again, one of the very sacred stupas uh, in Haripur district on the river. It looks better than, you know, at least the site looks better than the picture because it is surrounded by a river. And uh, most of the monks who have visited here felt a great deal of spiritual energy and they have performed these ceremonies here that I'll show you later. Like Julia Monastery, again, Texla is uh, one of the very better preserved monasteries since the British times. And again, it is because it was almost sort of a remotely, uh, sort of, a, it was, you know, inaccessible and on a remote corner. So it survived uh, the test of time. And there are these main stupas which are adorned with beautiful stucco sculptures reflecting Greek, Persian, and Roman aesthetic influences. And they are surrounded by these smaller votive stupas. And uh, the whole place is in a diaper masonry style. And uh, it's really a worth visiting place. Like, why is now Sirkap is a city settlement? Now there are there are these monasteries and stupas, and then there are these urban settlements like Serkab, like Sersok, like Bir. And as you will see in the museum, the, a whole lot of uh, you know, artifacts which were excavated from these sites and monasteries uh, are preserved in the museum because they could not be kept at the site. Now, as one result is that sites have been denuded almost. You know, uh, but, but at the same time, if you continue to make those connections between the site and the objects in the museum, I think the visit of the sites become more, uh, more informative, right? So likewise, this Mankala stupa uh, in Texla is again one of the very large stupa. It has been mentioned by these ancient Chinese and Korean travelers in their travelogues, and it is attributed to Kanishka. Now, Jinnawali Dheri, the Mount of Demons, is again an archaeological site near a village of that name. Uh, it is again a better preserved monastic complex, and it all the, you know, most of the architecture of these monasteries, because they were built under one dynastic rule, are almost similar. You know, you can almost, you know, you can, you know, if you look, they're like almost like copies of each other with minimum variation. But then the significant thing is that then there are these some certain stucco decorations uh, which are found in one place and not found in other place. And there are a bit of differences, but generally there are certain elements which are repeated. Dharma Rajika stupa in Texla is one of the most sacred stupas because it is attributed to have been built by Ashoka to house the remains of Lord Buddha. Right, so as a result, it is one of the massive, it has been rebuilt over time and there are a large number of these monasteries around. Another uh, museum in Pakistan, this uh, uh, National Museum in Karachi, also have a Gandhara collection. And uh, uh, it had, uh, you know, sort of lots of sculptures and also lots of old books and publications. Now, this brings us out of Gandhara and into Sindh. Now, I just want to, you know, finish with these couple of these uh, images where you would see that, uh, you know, this is that, 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 that 
that uh, Buddhist footprint is also found in Sindh. You know, for instance, uh, it is very little known uh, that uh, even by the time Islam came uh, to India in seventh century, the population, 70% population of Sindh was Buddhist. And so they were, they were under the Kushan rule and there's a whole lot that has happened that is not known. So I've listed these uh, uh, stupa there, even the Indus Valley site of Monjadoro also have a major stupa here. Now, now this, this brings me uh, to the end of this, you know, main discussion about, uh, about Gandhara civilization. And now I want to, you know, kind of invite you and introduce you to see how we are responding to this heritage and why we are responding to the heritage and how you can probably come in to see how, you know, we can go a step further. Now, what we did was uh, we finally, you know, high point was that we managed to establish a Gandhara Resource Center uh, in Texla. And it was uh, largely because of the presence of a, of a Buddhist monk from Korea, the gentleman uh, is sitting there. And he actually then, we thought that, yes, I, I think this is something that has to be, uh, you know, highlighted because he, he was in love with Gandhara and he, he just wanted to be here. He wanted to call himself a Gandhara monk and all that. Now we are acting like a facilitation center, Gandhara art gallery, book corner and so on other things, just to you know, keep the community engaged and keep us sort of floating. Now, uh, broadly we have done these for what we were doing is Gandhara lecture series. And uh, you know, especially in collaboration with the diplomatic missions from the Buddhist countries, were friendly nations uh, with Pakistan, like Sri Lanka, Thailand, Malaysia, and other. And so this is also, you know, we hold Visak Day celebrations, by the way, this is 2019, uh, that we held the Visak Day lectures. And uh, we also engaged with the archaeological community. We invited one of the professors from Japan to uh, give a, a lecture on the archaeological mission in Pakistan. So, uh, you know, this is also important. Likewise, we hold these events, the one uh, this is an event uh, lecture that I gave at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs addressing these young pa Pakistani diplomats as to the potential of Gandhara uh, for Pakistan cultural diplomacy. Likewise, we are also reviewing these legislation in Pakistan to make them more friendly. Uh, likewise, I said these Buddhist rituals, I mean, this was the first ritual, uh, you know, Visak Day that we celebrated and uh, with the cooperation of Sri Lankan High Commission, uh, and the Pakistani government, you can see this uh, Pakistani tourism minister uh, shaking hands uh, with this uh, Buddhist monk. Uh, and, and I think this is the kind of, uh, you know, meeting of the two worlds that we really uh, would like to uh, project to the world. Here you would see this, uh, there are these people before the ceremony. And this was a, another ceremony that we held at Bamala Stupa, right? And uh, it was again something which gathered lots of these Pakistani Muslims who were surely attracted uh, by the novelty of it. And they were also you know, in line with our sort of uh, understanding to, uh, to spread this message of peace across you know, religions. And they were like uh, Christians there and Buddhists and so on. <coughs> this is, excuse me, this is one of the you know, this year we held this Texla Visak Day Festival uh, at Texla, and then we had these ambassadors of uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Nepal who were there. It is a Bodhi tree in Texla Museum, so there was a ceremony there. And then we went to the Monastery of Mora Muradu, where the school children were also there. And these guys here, they are the Pakistani Buddhists from Sindh. You know, this again is something that is not known uh, about Pakistan that there are Pakistani Buddhists. There are thousands of these Buddhists who have no source of patronage, who are, you know, completely kind of gone astray, if you like. Now, in order for us to, you know, sort of showcase all this to the world, we think that Gandhara tourism is one of the ways. Now, first of all, as I said earlier, this tourist map of Pakistan, I think it's very useful. If you like have copies, we'll send you and if you'd like your own map to make your own itinerary as to where and how you want to go. 
right? Uh, likewise, we conduct these heritage tours, these guided tours, and this is a French delegation which came, and then there's a Japanese delegation, and then there's a Turkish ambassador who is given this uh, thing about VR. I, I'll tell you a little more about our ongoing activities to actually digitally document and uh, sort of uh, access these heritage sites through virtual reality. Uh, we also work with the communities because they are most important for us. Uh, unless you know their mind changes, nothing will go very far. So we have this uh, guided tour uh, of Sirka for Pakistani tourists, and then there are these school teachers and students uh, visiting Dharma Rajika Stupa. This is the community engagement uh, sort of a side of our work, which is that we have to uh, create heritage awareness. Uh, you know, most of, uh, you know, 99% people are Muslim and the heritage that we want to appreciate is Buddhist, uh, how to bridge the gap. So, so, so I think uh, for us, uh, one, way, uh, one way to go about it actually to highlight uh, the cultural uh, significance of it and the, and, and the message of peace there in, in the Buddhist Dharma. So instead of uh, you know highlighting the differences, we we are searching for common grounds, and we have found many. Now, now, and you see, these are the uh, Texla Chopal is a Chopal is a local Indian or Pakistani word for a, uh, for a village council, if you like. So, so we made this Texla Chopal where community gathers and we talk about all kinds of things. You know, we talk about archaeology, we talk about history, we talk about Buddhism, and we also celebrated, uh, you know, the birthday of a, a guy called Sir John Marshall. You know, uh, so uh, so I think this is another way of inculcating that sort of a place-based identity, if you like. You know, if it's not faith-based identity. Uh, it, there's always a place-based identity because then you say, okay, Padam Sambhava is from Sawat, I'm from Sawat. He's us, he's one of us. Not because that I'm, you know, I'm a Buddhist and he's a Buddhist and we are, we are together. So I think that is our, you know, motivation. And at the same time, you see, these are the two Buddhist leaders of, uh, they have formed the community, all Pakistan Buddhist Social Welfare Association in Sindh, and we are trying to help them and, uh, Inshallah, things will move forward. These are some of our activity pictures over the years that we bring in people from universities, from you know local community, from sort of city folks who have never been uh, to any heritage site and they have nothing, no interest whatsoever. But still, we try to inculcate that something will, uh, you know, a drop will you know, drop. <laughs> now, these are our very modest, small scale efforts like YouTube channel, Gandhara Times, uh, where we keep posting our activities. And this is a Gandhara Resource Center page where we also are putting in some of our things. And this is also our work in progress, exhibition artist residency, because we believe that unless, you know, artists try and sort of reimagine this heritage, it will not sort of, uh, it will not inform the public imagination. You know what I mean? Because art is a is a, is a transcend boundaries. And if, if this cultural heritage is articulated through art, so this is one way forward. So this was a project supported by UNESCO. Uh, and we held this Gandhara exhibition uh, in Texla. And uh, these are again, these local Sindhi Buddhists who were paying homage to the image. And then these are a Sri Lankan High Commissioner and uh, other diplomats. Now, very interestingly, this is a guy, this is a Korean Buddhist monk who when he came for an artist residency, he chose to do Islamic calligraphy. And this is something that I could never forget, you know. And if you like, look at this, you know, this, this is the, well, the kind of work that he was doing, right? So we didn't expect this from him. And honestly, you know, this was the last thing that we would expect, but this is how the world is. Now, again, in response, you know, or in contrast, this is a the artist, Pakistani artist, who was also inspired by history and archaeology and Buddhism. And then he uh, all was an artist in residence in the following year and he did loads of paintings. So we would like these exhibitions to travel. We, we had other exhibitions to which I have not listed here, 
recently on a Visak day. So we would like these exhibitions to travel to other countries, you know, otherwise these artists have no future. You know what I'm saying? If you do not connect them with the audience, that would appreciate it. This is only where this work will, will grow and this will flow, right? Now, this is the Pakistani Buddhist Dira I keep mentioning, and we brought them in contact with Sri Lankan High Commission, and they held these prayer ceremonies uh, in the Buddhist temple. By the way, this is a Buddhist temple in Pakistan, in Islamabad. And if you come here, you can surely visit it. So th these are the interactions uh, with the Islamic clerk and uh, with the armed forces that we think are very much committed uh, a, a, to promoting Buddhism and Gandhara as a symbol of international peace for the world. So we, we are trying to, you know, get as many stakeholders as possible on board so we can actually uh, make a lasting impact. Uh, finally, you know, digital documentation and reconstruction of Buddhist heritage is something that we are uh, doing because we believe the high quality images uh, are necessary, they are for the promotion, preservation uh, is important, it could take place through images. And we are also into the virtual reality uh, to pr preserve, promote also heritage tourism, right? I would, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but uh, this is like a, a digital uh, uh, a reconstruction of a monastery in Pakistan uh, that uh, I thought that I will uh, kind of uh, end with. And if you want to uh, watch it, like three, four minutes thing, uh, you can. Otherwise, I will sort of trim it and stop whenever you want.